Thank you, committee members. My name is Derek Wilcox. I'm the senior attorney at the Mackinac Center. And I was going to speak today on the why to, uh, if the legislator is to protect free speech of the universities, a constitutional amendment is necessary because of the fairly unique structure of the Michigan Constitution. Uh, for the legislature to protect free speech on college campuses through the legislative process would likely require a constitutional amendment due to the extensive powers granted exclusively to the administrators of the colleges, colleges and universities through our Constitution. While the legislature can exert the general police powers of the state, it cannot encroach on the autonomy in the sphere of education. Given how closely related free speech and the free exchange of ideas is to the educational mission, it's doubtful that the courts would give the nod to the legislature if the legislature had conflicting ideas about protecting free speech that it sought to enforce solely through its general powers, rather through a constitutional provision specifically about such oversight. Regarding whether a constitutional amendment is necessary and whether or not any powers therein were general or specific to free speech, I would say that given the extensive constitutional authority that the institutions have, legislative authority, although it has been used to a limited degree, as uh, Representative Runstead ran down a list at the introduction of this hearing, has only been done after uh, has only been used to a limited degree, has only been done after prolonged consideration by the courts, and has only been done to the degree allowed by the courts. For instance, in 1970, the question arose of whether University of Michigan employees were public employees within the scope of the Public Employees Relation Act, or whether, given the autonomy the university had, it could manage its labor affairs separate from the Paris system. It took several years to work up through the Supreme Court, which eventually held that a conflict between the Constitution and a statute is clearly a legal question which only a court can decide. And while the court here found that the legislature could impose some parameters on employment at the university, the university retained control over those elements that touched most closely upon education. And since time's limited, I won't read from the case, but it touched on assignments in, uh, for instance, the medical field and so forth. So my point is, where the legislator exerted some control over the university, using only its existing legislative authority, it took years of litigation and it fell to the courts to sort out the parameters because of the conflict between the Constitution and a statute. And the final determination may or may not have reflected what the legislature at the time had intended. Similarly, if there were a new broad or general constitutional power of the legislature over the universities, instead of one that spoke specifically to free speech, I'll note again that in the uh, proposed uh, legislation it speaks very specifically to the power of law to protect free speech, so it's specific. But if it were general instead of specific, then we would again have an impasse which would require resolution by the courts because the institution's grant of autonomy, the institution's grant of autonomy is also general and broad. Two general powers of the same level, both constitutional in nature, would require quite a bit of hair splitting and analysis to decide who had the proper authority in the event of a conflict. However, where one party has a grant of specific authority, such as protecting free speech here, while the other has general authority, the courts have little trouble harmonizing the two and finding that the grant of specific power prevails in that specific area. That was the case in a case called National Pride at Work, where the state's constitutional marriage amendment conflicted with policies enacted by the state's universities by administrators who had constitutional general authority to manage the universities. The specific power of the marriage amendment prevailed over the general managerial powers of the institutions. Other legislative processes have been allowed to encroach on the administration of these educational institutions, but again, these were not matters directly related to education. Reporting measures, such as finances, have passed the constitutional test. Uh, I assume the, the extending FOIA reporting requirements have had the same relatively easy path, since these did not directly implicate the educational realm over which the universities have constitutional control. These laws supporting open government and transparency are more of a fit under the legislature's general police powers. And lastly, even with a constitutional amendment, as we have seen uh, before us here, a potential problem I see could arise because there's conflict based on the power of the purse. While the new Section 10 in HJRP grants the legislature the power to provide by law for the protection of free speech, which shall supersede any inconsistent restriction prescribed by a public institution, it's not clear to me what would happen if the institution chose to withhold funding from whatever the legislature prescribed. 
Under Article 8, Section 5, for instance, the university, universities retain the control and direction of all expenditures from the institution's funds. Our Supreme Court has upheld that very strongly, that they have uh, complete control over the university and all expenditures. It's well established the section gives the regents the entire control and management of the university affairs, including the management of property and expenditures of funds to the exclusion of all other departments of the state. As the legislature may not encroach on the regents' power, once state funds are appropriated to the university, only the regents may direct how they are spent. The legislature may put certain conditions on money it appropriates for the university, which are binding if the regents accept the money. These conditions may not interfere with the regents' management of the university and may be applied only to the state appropriated funds. So you can imagine a case where, say, the threat of violence was used as a pretext to deny speakers a forum. And the legislature speaks to this by providing, by law, that the university has to provide adequate protection in such instances. Yet the university retained their absolute discretion over expenditures of the university's funds and declined to allocate the necessary resources. Absent a separate allocation from the general fund, could the legislature direct such protection? I think there's at least an argument that it could not under HJRP. On the whole, the Mackinac Center uh, supports this, uh, this legislation. Um, and I'll yield, I guess I don't have any more time, no, but I'll sir. take any questions, probably past 10.30. Yes, sir, we, we're, we started on time, finished on time, per that clock. So thank you so much.